Our topic this morning will be living a joyful life. Living a joyful life. Joy is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. When you look at the fruits of the Holy Spirit, joy will be one of them. Many people rejoice when good things happen to their lives. Now, even in this December, people get bonuses, they get gifts. So that gives you a reason to be joyful and to rejoice. Now, but the Bible teaches us that joy is not determined by the circumstances that you go through in life. Joy, if it's determined by circumstances, that will mean your joy will arise and fall based on whether the blue bull, uh, bulls win or the sharks they lose. That would determine your joy. If you are a fan of uh, soccer, it will be determined by the performance of Orlando Pirates or the performance of KZ Chiefs. So that is what will be determining your joy. But I want to draw your attention to Philippians chapter 4. This is the letter that is known more than anything else as a joyful letter. And as Paul is writing this letter, he, he says this time and again. He says, rejoice always. I say rejoice. So it is very important that we encourage the church to live a joyful life life, a joyful life. Philippians chapter 4, we will begin to read from verse 10. I will read other verses. Let us read verse 10 for now. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at land you have revived your consent for me. You were indeed consent for me but you had no opportunity. Now, the background of this letter, Paul is writing this letter to the church of Philippi. Now, where is Paul as he's writing this letter? He is in prison, a place that you may not think someone will be joyful or will be happy to be in prison. But why Paul is in prison? Paul is not in prison because he, he didn't keep up to the speed limits and then he got arrested. That was not the reason. But Paul is in prison for the sake of the gospel, for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is why he's in prison. But as he's been in prison, he now writes to this church. What makes him more... Uh, provoke him to write this letter is that this church would have sent a man by the name of Epaphroditus to go and serve Paul in prison and bring some gifts as well to Paul. So this is the background of this letter. And now as Paul is writing to them, he, he, he encourages them to rejoice as he gives them an example of rejoicing in all circumstances. As you see the beginning of verse 10, he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Now, if you were to ask Paul, what makes you to rejoice greatly in all that has been happening around you in your life? Why are you rejoicing so greatly? He says that now at length, you have revived your consent for me. You were indeed consent for me, but you had no opportunity. N now, if you are looking at this verse, you may say, is, is, is Paul complaining now? Is he complaining to this church? This is where we find the first way of rejoicing in the Lord. How should you rejoice in the Lord? By being selfless. Selfless in your service. 
And Paul, now as you look at this verse, it says, What makes me to rejoice so greatly is that you at length, you have revived your concern for me. Now it's like the, the concern of this church for Paul, or he was feeling like he's dying. But for him to see Epaphrodite and showing up with the gifts, not only the gifts, is not dropping the gifts and going back, but is taking calm and is ministering to Paul. He brings an encouragement to him. Now, this is what makes him just look at this church that indeed they are so selfless in their save, uh, serving. They are selfless in their, in their serving. Hence, Paul will say, I rejoice greatly. Brothers and sisters, these words can be said of Brockenhurst Baptist Church. Any missionary that is supported by this church can say these words. That when we think of this church in the townships where we are serving the Lord, we are full of joy. We are not thinking of this church and have complaints in our heart. You do more than we expect. You just fill our hearts with joy. Now as I'm looking at Paul's epistle, I was like, uh, Paul was a pastor who was able to praise you where praises is due. And to say, we are so thankful. I think other brothers who are being supported, uh, prayed for by this church, they may say the same words they may rejoice as well. So it's your service that is selfless. It's selfless and is serving the Lord Jesus Christ. A selfless service is not being concerned about your life, about your own needs, but to be concerned about the life of others as well. What is happening in their lives? And this will be true for the members of this church. Understanding that if you are part and you are a member of this church, this is a selfless church. Amen. Now you, you look at the members, they're like, what did you say? <laughs> selfless church. Serving one another. I will bring that encouragement. There's nothing that strengthens the faith of believers just to know. Believers do care for one another. You may go in the world, everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes, but when you come to church, we call ourselves brothers and sisters. We love one another. In spite of our color, in spite of our backgrounds, in spite of uh, uh, the language that we speak, we love one another in church. We seek to learn your language so that we'll be able to speak to one another. That's how we love one another. So firstly, Paul, he says to this church, they, they, they didn't have an opportunity. He, it's like he's looking at his situation, his time being in prison, to say this has provided an opportunity for the church to begin to serve. Now we look at difficult times, we look at problems, we look at marriage issues, we look at children uh, problems that we face, and we're like, ah, why this? Why this? I is it uh, Ichabod? Is it the glory of God has departed? No, it's not. It's not. It's just providing opportunities. Opportunities for the church to serve. For the church to serve. Not only that. But look in verse 7, that Paul gives us another way of living a joyful life. By being content. Being content. Look in, in Philippians chapter 4 verse 11. Not that I am speaking of being in need. For I have learned in whatever situations I am to be content. Verse 12, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, 
I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, Paul is one of the preachers who knew that when you speak, people, they interpret what you are saying. And he was very careful that they don't misinterpret him. Now, they may think wrong in what he's saying, then he's helping them. That do not think that now I'm discontent, I'm not, I'm not content, I'm not really thankful for what you've been giving me. Now that's why he's making sure that they don't misunderstand him. He corrects those thoughts. If anyone will be thinking that this is Paul's way of persuading us to, to, to give more, he's correcting those thoughts. Now look again in verse 11. He says, I, I know how to be brought low. Paul says, I know that. I know that circumstances, that situation of being low, where your pride is stripped off. You know, that is the position we don't pray for. We don't want to be brought low. You don't. And Paul says, I know to be brought low. I know to be brought low. But he also says, I know to abound. I know to have more. But he says, you know what? I've learned a secret. Now, what is the secret that he's talking about here that he said I have learned? He says, I've learned the secret. Now, what is the secret? The secret is not like you will have joy when you have more. I've learned the secret that uh, you will lose joy when you don't have anything. He says, I've learned the secret that my joy is not determined by the circumstances I am in. The circumstances will change in my life. Now, if you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the Bible says there is time for a rejoicing, right? But it says there is time for what? For crying, for weeping. So he understands, it's like King Solomon who understands this. That there will be time where things are going well in your life. Where your business is doing well. Where to work, you are getting promotions. You are doing well. It's like God's face is smiling on your life. It's all well. But Paul understand, there's a time where things may not go well. There's a time where a rent versus a dollar will lose way, uh, uh, its strength. There's a time where you will be demoted. There's a time where you write that exam, you do well, you study hard, but the results are not what you expected. There's time for that. So when that happens, what do you do? What do you do? You lose your joy. You look down. It's all gone. Is that what you do? No, Paul is not saying that here. He's saying the secret is to be content. Is to be content in whatever situation that I am in, I have learned that my joy will not be determined by the circumstances. I will be content. I will be content. If you may look at things, brothers and sisters, that takes your joy, sometimes it's because we are, need, we are not content in that situation. And God has permitted that situation, right? He has all powers. He could have stopped all those situations, but God has permitted those situations, has allowed those situations to your life. He has done that. So you better be content in him. You better be content in him. Paul says, I've learned the secret to be content with whatever circumstances that comes. Not only to be content when you are doing well, but when you are not doing well, you start not to be rejoicing. Now, not only that, but notice in verse 14 to 16, and Paul gives us another way of living a joyful life. In verse 14 to 16, yet it was kind of you 
to share my troubles. And you, Philippians, yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Now, number three, that will be a thankfulness. Learning to be thankful to the Lord. If you notice and you look this verse, Paul is looking at to this church and is so thankful to them. He says, it was kind of you. It was kind. Now, you, you, you are looking at this, you say, Paul, were you not expecting them to do this? He says this, you were so kind to me. You were kind to share. That will be the word to partake, to take part in my troubles. It's like in Galatians chapter 6 where the Bible says, bear each other's burden. And he's saying to this church, it was kind of you to partake in my troubles, to share with me. You were so kind by doing that. And now we explain how have they partake, how have they been kind. Notice in verse 15. And you, Philippians, that will be the plural, you all, the church of Philippians. And he's qualifying it when he's saying, and you, Philippians. He puts their name there. He's not saying, and you, Ephesus, and you, Corinthians, and you, Thessalonians. He's not saying that. He's specifically saying, and you. And you. And you, Philippians, yourself know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you. Then what is the next suite? Only. Except you. Only. Now, he, he's saying here, you know this. You know what has happened when I was set apart to go and preach the gospel. When I left Macedonia, you know what happened. You were the only one giving. You know, it's easy when you are the only one giving to start complaining. What are other churches doing? What are other Christians doing? Why are they not giving? And Paul is saying, only you, you have given to my needs. He's thankful, brothers and sisters. He's thankful. He says, only you, you have given. You have given when I left Macedonia. Notice there in verse 16. He says, even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. He said, you send me help. You have given to me. He is thankful. He is thankful. As I said, and I would like to repeat, that we are very thankful for the giving of this church to the township ministries where we are serving in Daviton. Your love, always, it always warms our hearts. When we pray, when we think of you, we are thankful. You may have other things that makes you to be thankful of. Now, I, I, I don't know about here. Uh, I know in, in, in our church we don't uh, put uh, the time to thank God to be part of the program. I don't know. Maybe you do have, right? There are things that uh, makes us Baptist. We, we check. If you have certain things, we start wondering. Eh? I, <laughs> Are you a true Baptist? Okay. So, but just thinking of this, thanking the Lord, it is a blessing. Some churches do it in their evening service where people stand up here and just thank God or in their Bible studies and thank God for what God has done in their lives. Now, even in your life, sometimes it will be helpful that you write, you look back and say, what is it that the Lord has been doing for me? It is easy for us as believers to forget what the Lord has done for us. 
It is easy to forget. It is easy to be like the children of Israel when they were leaving Egypt and when now they are not having food and they are not having water, they start saying, oh, we miss the garlics of Egypt. It is easy. So now it's helpful that you take your journal and you just write, what is it that the Lord has done for your family? What is it that the Lord has done for your children? What is it that the Lord has done for uh, your parents? And on and on. That you will be able, even in times of discouragement, even if you were like Paul, you were in, 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 in prison, so to speak, you would be able to read and look and say, God has been good to us. God has been good to us. That, brothers and sisters, as a way of encouraging you, bringing a smile in you, as you look and say, God, you've been good to us. We've been good to us. Yesterday we were celebrating our sixth year of marriage and after the end of the day I was just thinking that God in the past six years you've been God to us. That encourages you. Now I say why should I start doubting you now? You've been good to us. You've been good. That's what Paul is saying here, brothers. So be encouraged as well. Look back. Look what God has done. And be thankful. Let me take this time as well and, uh, and address the children as well. It is easy to think that you deserve what you have. It is easy to think that the provision your parents are giving you, you deserve it. And not take some time and reflect to God and say, God, thank you for my parents. And say, God, thank you for the best schools that they are sending me in. And say, God, thank you for the needs that I have that I'm asking them. Thank you and not end there. Take time and write a letter and say, dear mommy and daddy, thank you for spanking me as well. Huh? And then write in that list the things that you are thankful for to the Lord. The things that he has done through them and thank them. Now husband are looking at me and say, brother, you suggest him we do the same to our wives. Yes! <laughs> Why not? Why not take time and look at the things they've done for us and thank the Lord for them and let them read that note. Can we do the same for our pastors? For our elders? Yes. Yes. Encouraging them. When they open their emails on the Monday, you know they say the pastor is happy until Monday. Because on Monday when the email comes and say, Pastor, I don't agree with point number two. Yes, okay. All right, at least, okay, at least, okay. Pastor is not here, he told me he's not here, okay. So, at least, if you don't agree with point number two, at least write half of the letter thanking the pastor for the points you agree with. <laughs> And then come to point number two and say, a bit of adjustment in point number two. Be thankful, brothers and sisters, and let's make it practical and, and, and speak to one another, thanking one another for what the Lord has done. Now, we don't only see that joy is coming in your life or living a joyful life will demand one to be selfless and it will demand one to be a content person and will also demand one to be a thankful person a thankful person but lastly to be a generous person in your giving generous in your giving now in verse 17 Paul repeats not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. 
Verse 18, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts to you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now as you look at that last part, being generous in your giving, and Paul is saying again, I'm not, it's not that I'm looking you to give again to me, but he's using that word that I, I just want you to have this fruit. And what is this fruit that is he talking about? Now when you look at uh, that word, actually Dr. John MacArthur, he says that is to abound or is to increase. Now in the very same uh, line, he adds to say, I seek the fruit, then he qualifies that increase to your credit. That is the fruit that increased to, the, to your credit. What is he talking about? Is he bringing a prosperity gospel? That as you uh, keep giving, now the man will give more to you and you will have fruits that are abounding and are increasing and the more you give, the more is coming. Is this what is he talking about? I don't think so. Because he's saying this is increasing to your account. Using that word account, which account is he talking about? Is he saying as you generously give to, to people, to missionaries, to us, as you give, then your bank balance is also increasing? Is this what he's talking about? He's not talking about that. But he's talking about your account in heaven. He's talking about your account in heaven. Remember our Lord Jesus says, store up your treasures where? In heaven. Where you're not going to lose your sleep because you're thinking of the hackers. They will uh, hack my account and all my money is gone. Eh? It's December. You are warned that. Be careful. Eh? Say, eh, eh, eh. My money. All my savings will be gone. He's saying store up your treasures in heaven. They are safe and secure. Oh, friends, unfortunately, in giving your time, yourself, your money, serving the Lord Jesus Christ, your account is increasing in heaven. Your account is increasing in heaven. Somebody says, brothers and sisters, we're not going to take our nice cars, our nice houses into heaven. But he says we'll go there with souls, with people. That's why, or that's what encourages us to share the gospel with our families. To tell them about this love of Jesus Christ. To bring to them the greatest gift. Even in this December. That God has already given us a gift. That is Jesus Christ. That is what, brothers and sisters, we can take to heaven as we meet there and say, praise God, praise God. So that's what Paul is talking about to say. Let's focus in heavenly things, not only in earthly things. Does that mean Paul doesn't care about what is happening in our everyday life? No, he does care. Notice the next part of the verse. In verse 18, he says, I have received full payment and more. And I am well supplied, having received from Apaphroditus the gifts you sent. It's a, it's a fragrant offering, a sacrifice. It's not just a gift. You sacrifice yourself, he says, acceptable and pleasing to God. Now, I was expecting to say, your gift is pleasing to me. Have you noticed he's saying, this gift is pleasing to God? But they were giving it to him, but he's saying it's pleasing to God. He's pleasing to God. 
Now in verse 19, since your gift is pleasing to God and my God will supply every need of you according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. My God will supply your needs, will take care of your needs according to his riches in glory based on how great he is, how rich he is, he will supply all your needs. Oh, friends, this encourages us in our giving, knowing that the Lord, he is the one who is taking care of us. It's not our strength, it's not our wisdom, but it's him who is taking care of us. And Paul is giving them this, this promise to say, as you give generously, my God will supply your needs. Giving challenges our trust and dependency upon God. It challenges our trust and our dependence upon God to say, do we really trust him? Do we really trust his word? Do we really trust his ways of doing things? Do we really trust him? That's what he's saying. And Paul is saying, I know my God will supply your needs. Now I'm glad again, it's not going, the prosperity preaching here is not saying, uh, then I will uh, lay my hands on you and you will be blessed. And he's not saying all that. He's saying, my God. He's the one who will determine what is your needs. Not someone else. Not some prophet somewhere. He's not saying that. He's saying, my God is the one who knows your needs. I may miss your needs. I may not know your need. But my God knows what is your need. And he says, my God will supply your needs according to his riches. Somebody else has explained this part that according to uh, uh, his riches, not out of his riches, but according to his riches. The better illustration to explain this is that when a person has a thousand rand, then you just give one or two people to someone and give a um, hundred rand, you have basically given out of what you have. But if you give according to what you have, you start giving sort of half, 70, ah. Now you are giving according to what you are having. And he's saying, my God is generous. He gives according to what is having. Friends, you may be here this morning. But you may not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who love the Lord, they experience this joy because of Jesus. He has saved them. He has changed their lives. But if you are not a Christian, you don't have to give to God. It's not like he wants your money. It's not like there's anything that he wants from you. You can ask him to accept you. It's you, friends, who need him. It's you who need him in your life. You need to repent, turn away from your sins, and come to him. Why? Somebody may ask, why? Pastor, you're saying I need him. All things is fine. I'm doing well in my life. No, my friend, no. You have broken his laws. You have broken his laws many times. You probably have been thanking him this whole year for what he has done. You have not thanked him. You probably have not loved your wife the way you should have loved your wife. 
You probably don't treat your kids the way you should have treated them. Oh, friends, there's many more things you have done in breaking his laws. May I ask him to forgive you your sins, turn away from them, and turn to him. And when we do that, grant you his Holy Spirit that helps you each and every day to live according to his word as you study his word. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word that is active and living sharper than any double-edged sword. We pray, O oh Father, for everyone who is here, that, Lord, as we rejoice in even in this December, that we may continue, O oh God, to thank you for all that you have done for us. And above all, we are thanking you for Jesus Christ, who has saved us, O oh God. We pray that may your mercies and your grace be with all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.